start with a little review of what we talked about last time, uh, really all about getting viruses into cells. And again, this is the big picture. Today we'll start to talk about one particular group of viruses and how they're getting inside of cells. But first step has to be that the virion recognizes the cell that it's trying to get into. One piece of terminology that I forget if I'd mentioned before, but it's important to emphasize is what we call tropism. And tropism is then the particular cells that a particular virus can infect and literally bind to. So the tropism of a particular virus, say influenza virus, is um, epithelia that it are in your lungs and upper respiratory tract. So um, that's important idea here. Um, and of course, if that's something that can be blocked, that is by far and away the best way to treat um, some kind of virus related disease. And that's exactly, of course, what antibodies do. Um, entry, which is the next step, you know, binding is all well and good, but you've got the genome on the interior of your virion that now needs to get inside the cell in order to be able to be replicated. And so lots of different ways that that can happen, but the two big ones are some kind of cell-mediated process, usually receptor-mediated endocytosis, or making a hole somehow in the outside of the cell or sometimes even in an internal membrane. Um, and that's particularly true for the bacteriophages, is this you know, breaking and entering kind of process. Particularly if you, again, to other amphiporphies, are a enveloped virion. Very often you'll have a capsid inside an envelope, and then somehow the genome has to get outside of that capsid as well. So that's another step that many of these viruses have to deal with in terms of releasing their genome. If there's something like a bacteriophage, however, or at least the bacteriophage T4 that we looked at, the entry and release process are actually simultaneous. So it's releasing the genome immediately. Um, and that can be you know, fusions of membranes or actually making holes um, by usually viral processes. Because if you think about it, usually from the cell's point of view, holes in membranes are usually not a very good idea. So um, that's very much a viral process. Talked a little bit about nuclear entry. And again, these are all things that we'll come back to later on. You have to get into the nucleus, particularly if you're a DNA virus, because that's where all of the DNA replication machinery is, but also true for some RNA viruses, because at least as far as the RNA is concerned, you want to be in the nucleus as well, because that's where the vast majority, actually probably all people argue about it, um, transcription is taking place, is also taking place in the nucleus. So that's where all the RNA functional machinery is for making more RNAs. And then we talked a little bit about the drugs. And again, the best ones are the ones that start at the very beginning. Um, and then, but there are certainly drugs that can address all of the different steps as you move along through the process. Any more questions about entry before we move on and talk about bacteriophage? Okay, so <clears throat> today, very, very, very brief introduction to phage. Um, if you want to know more, um, come and find the Stedman Phage Library. Um, this is a anniversary book for the anniversary of the discovery of bacteriophage. Um, a couple of years ago in San Diego, some friends of mine put on um, the, the phage birthday party, or the, and this is the field guide to the Earth's most diverse inhabitants. Um, and it's really fun if you're into steampunk. Also, the uh, illustrations are really neat as well. Uh, so after that really brief phage introduction, we'll move on and talk more about RNA phage. As I think I mentioned far too often in molecular biology, we could spend a whole term working on it. There's a whole book on RNA phages, actually a relatively old book, because people haven't worked on RNA phages for a while, although they're really starting to work more on RNA phages. And we'll look at some of the details about that a little bit later on today. But the important sort of take home messages with these RNA phages, and it's true also for all of the RNA viruses, partly why we start with these, they're nice simple systems, and then we'll expand on them later on, is whenever you have RNA as your genome, you're also using that RNA to translate. And so you're fundamentally going to have this difficulty between replication versus translation, because you can't have them happen simultaneously. And so dealing with that is what all RNA viruses have to deal with. And very well known, in fact, in terms of how these particular RNA phages work, but 
many of the other RNA phages as well. So anytime we talk about an RNA virus, any of those, how many Baltimore classes are there again? Like three different Baltimore classes of which have RNA genomes, you have to deal with this particular aspect. And a couple of years ago, some students asked me to put up some key concepts at the beginning of every lecture. Good things to study for midterms. Um, and <clears throat> big thing here, again, you know, phage in general, but alternative secondary structures. This is true for particularly these RNA phage, but really for any kind of RNA virus, and for that matter, also the single-stranded DNA viruses. Secondary structures, so where you have a single strand or single molecule of RNA that forms some kind of base pairing interaction in order to give it a three-dimensional structure, that's really critical in terms of understanding some of these fundamental aspects of what goes on with RNA phage replication, DNA virus replication, um, et cetera. And also here, particularly true with these RNA phage, they're very small, they have very small genomes, so they're very, very dependent on host proteins. And so we'll talk about some of those um, host proteins a little um, later on. So what's a phage? Um, phage is just the abbreviation for bacteriophage. Um, anybody, and I'm not gonna ask a particular question here, know the Greek for phagos? Phagos is to eat, exactly. So these are things that eat bacteria. And so if you make a lawn of your bacteria, like some of those plaque assays that I showed earlier on, and they have holes that have been eaten in them, those are your bacteriophage, which are eating the bacteria. So what's eating the bacteria? There are lots of things that could, but um, in this case, they are filterable, um, filterable agents. So what did we talk about filterable agents before? And I can get back to my lists. Um, crystal, what was crystal something last time? Did I ask you last time? Okay, so I forgot to check you off my list. Um, Jason, Pam? No, okay, John Doty? Yeah, so what I've decided to do is to throw you a virus or a virion, okay, and if you want to pass it along to someone else, <laughs> then you're welcome to. This is an idea that we came up with in the lab yesterday, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Yeah, why, why is filterable so important? <laughs> so what did we talk about filterable before? What about sort of your definitions of viruses from way back lecture one? You remember any of those? You're welcome to pass it. You can certainly pass it, you know, throw, 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 the, throw the virus to somebody else, <laughs> if you like. Who wants the virus? <laughs> or virion, I should say. See, I keep doing that. Or something after a social link, and now it's being filtered because we can't purify the knot and stop it. Okay, so that's, that's one way of thinking about it, but the original definition of viruses was something that would pass through these filters, and it wasn't a bacterium then by definition, and so that was sort of the idea. So, yeah, filter means these are viruses, and this is very soon after you know, 1898 when you had the tobacco mosaic virus and then soon thereafter also mouth disease. So something that's eating bacteria but can go through filters. And so that's where both <coughs> Frederick Tewart and Felix Tell, um, Frederick Tewart is actually the one who is generally given the priority and that's why we had this party in 2015. Uh, but Felix Terrell was really the one who popularized all of these working with viruses and particularly phage therapy. And so this is his sort of you know, magnum opus, Le Bacteriophage Son Rôle dans l'Immunité, but it's really talking all about using bacteriophage for phage therapy. It's about 170 pages. I can post it on B12 if anyone wants to, to read it. I think there are English translations as well. Um, but <clears throat> And he was really the popularizer of this whole idea of using, yeah, bacteriophage therapy. So now let's talk about these RNA phages. Um, again, a little overview of what we'll talk about, where they come from. Um, not a particularly salubrious place, but a place where you can find lots and lots of viruses that infect bacteria. Um, the structure, and this is a 
older version of the structure here, and that's when I talk about some of the new stuff coming along. Um, we have a lot more insights into the structures now. And then, you know, big deal here, translation replications is all about those secondary structures. And then if we have a chance at the end, I'll talk about some applications of using some of the proteins from these RNA viruses for biotechnology purposes. So where were they found? Uh, the first of these viruses, um, known as the F2 virus, um, was in fact isolated by Norton Zinder, who is the editor of this whole book, um, when he and some of his colleagues were basically just looking for viruses that infected E. coli. So where do you go to find viruses that infect E. coli? Where do we, a lot of E. coli come from? They come from our guts. Where did what was in our guts end up? In sewage treatment plants. So turns out you can find all kinds of really good viruses. And we'll talk about quite a few bacteriophages that people have found in these sewage treatment plants. Um, and one of the amazing things about these viruses, there can be present at tens of millions of PFUs I should have on there per milliliter. So really, really high concentrations of these RNA phage. And what they'd been looking for were bacteriophages that were dependent on the F pillus. And um, I know some of you haven't had microbiology, so I'm not going to put anybody on the spot for this one. Anyone want the, the virion to tell me what the F pillus is? Anybody want a virion? Okay, so the, the F pillus is the sex factor um, of E. coli. So this is what allows conjugation between different E. coli strains. Anybody want the virion to tell me why you would want to have viruses that were F pillus dependent? Any ideas? Any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, so not so much the viruses, but you're exactly on the right track. The whole idea is genetics. So, so the, the point of this was really trying to figure out genetics in bacteria. And so these F pili are also conjugations. They're transferring genes from one E. coli to the other. If you had viruses that would infect specifically the ones which would be transferring those genes, maybe they could transfer the virus genes as well. So there's sort of a way of engineering and thinking about how these uh, conjugation processes would be taking place. So yeah, it's exactly right. It's a genetics issue. Yep. And you can tell me whether you like the throwing the virion around or not later on in the course. So <clears throat> that's what they were looking for. Um, they found these really clear plaques. And clear plaques will be important when we talk about some of the other bacterial viruses a little bit later on. But the take home message with clear plaques is it means that you have blasted open the cell. Because a plaque that is non-clear means it just slowed down the growth. So we're talking about viruses which are lysing the cells. We'll talk about that lysing process a little bit later on. So it turns out that there are lots and lots and lots of these viruses. We're mostly going to talk about um, Q-beta and also uh, RNA phage called MS2. These are just the ones which have been best studied. Um, Q-beta is a slightly larger one, um, but it turns out that this is one that's been used a lot for biotechnology purposes, and so that's why we'll spend more time talking about it. Another reason that they liked to have these particular viruses was that these are great sources of RNA and, to some extent, DNA, but really large amounts of homogeneous RNA that you can then use in other experiments. So say you're interested in looking at translation. Okay, if you're looking at translation, it'd be really nice to have a really defined RNA and a whole bunch of a particularly defined RNA. And so another reason that people were really excited about the RNA phages was it's a way to make a ton of RNA. And this was in the days before all of the ways you can do recombinant DNA processes. So there were great sources of RNA. So it's also one of the reasons that you know, people spent so much time um, working on them in the late 60s and early 70s. Now, unfortunately, though, this book I don't know when it was published, but uh, 1974. Um, and actually, since 1974, very little work was done on these RNA phages until metagenomics came along. And people started to sequence lots of environments. 
and find the environmental RNAs and DNAs which are there. And it turns out that there are lots and lots of these RNA phages um, present in a number of different environments. But the two that have been best studied, again, are these MS2 and Q-beta. And this is, brings me to the, the point of, are viruses alive? Yes, we can discuss that ad nauseum, preferably after the term, and I've turned in your grades over at Rogue. Uh, but <clears throat> four proteins, and literally four genes. Um, we'll see a little bit later on, you can actually get away with literally just two genes um, to have a functional virus. Uh, you have to have a capsid, and here um, these are always listed as coproteins because that's kind of the definition of viruses. You have to have a virion. And then you have to have some way of helping to make your genome. Um, and in the case of these RNA viruses, these are not called polymerases. We call them replicases. Um, why would we generally call it a replicase? Any ideas here? Thoughts, wonders? Put somebody on the spot. Yeah. What would you call it a replicase? Okay. Well, so what what is one, what's going to be very different about a replicase for this kind of virus? Okay, so these are just RNAs. So what kind of polymerase or replicates with these? What's, what's it make us going to be making? Yeah, so this is actually not a reverse transcriptase. It's an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So it's just RNA. So it's a protein that takes an RNA template and makes RNA from it. And um, very often these will also be called RDRPs, so RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. We'll talk a lot more about these later on. But these particular viruses, and sorry, I should have explained this better, obviously, uh, is that they never see DNA at all. So it's RNA, goes, that's the messenger RNA, and it turns out these are positive strands, so it can be translated directly. And then a negative strand or nonsense strand needs to be made, and then a sense strand needs to be made. But there's no DNA involved in that process at all. So um, that's one of the reasons it's called the replicase rather than you know, polymerase, because most people when they see polymerase, they go, oh, it's a DNA polymerase. But, you know, or it's an RNA polymerase, but when people think about RNA polymerase, that was used to be the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is being used for trans transcription. So yes, the replicase here is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Anytime we see RNA or RNA-only viruses, you'll have this kind of protein. So those are really the only two things you need. However, um, these guys have a couple of extra genes that are associated with them. One of them is this lysis protein that's present in MS2. And lysis makes sense. These are bacterial viruses. So they've got to get out of the cell somehow. Um, the most bacteria bud vesicles. Not very many of them do. Well, actually, we're finding out more and more do. We used to think that it never happened. <laughs> but uh, these guys are replicating by lysis. How else do we know that they're replicating by lysis? Put Brian on the spot. Oh, here you go. Oh, so I can't. I got to throw it further. I got to get my arm worked out better here. <laughs> okay. They do not have an envelope, which is one thing. But I told you earlier, when discovered them. How did they figure that out? Over there. Toss, toss, toss the virion. <laughs> exactly. Clear plaques. So if you have a clear plaque, it's lysing. And so there's got to be some way that lysis can take place. And what's interesting is actually between these two otherwise very closely related viruses, um, this one has a lysis protein. This one actually doesn't have a lysis protein. And so for a long time, it was actually not clear how Q-beta um, went about lysing the cell. Um, so that was another thing. They also have, what else are you going to need? Now, in theory, your coat could also bind to virus receptors, but what do we, particularly for envelope viruses, somebody was talking about envelope viruses earlier, um, what do you usually have in one of those envelope proteins usually? Anybody toss the virion? <laughs> so what do envelope proteins interact with? Receptors, so they also be known as receptor binding proteins. Um, so in this case, it's also known as the maturation protein. So sometimes it'll be your coat, but in this case, it's the maturation protein. So the maturation protein 
is what binds to the host, and we'll see what that is in just a second. So four proteins, receptor binding protein, coat to make a capsid, RNA dependent RNA polymerase, and lysis protein. All you need, and actually it turns out, in the case of Q-beta, you don't even need a lysis protein. You've got this funky read-through protein, um, and this is something we'll talk a lot more about later on. This is how many viruses can very efficiently use their genomes. The most efficient uses of genomes we'll talk about on Monday. But here you have a particular stretch of your genome, which actually codes for two proteins with two different functions. And what happens here is most of the time you make coprotein, but 94% of the time, but 6% of the time, there's a stop codon that actually gets misread, and you end up with a tryptophan, and you end up with this much longer protein. Exactly what the function of this read-through protein is, is discussed at length in this textbook, and we're not going to get into it. Um, but basically, um, Q-beta can actually get away with just three proteins. And so the big question, again, with Q-beta was, is it a, what's the lysis protein? What's going on there? So what's the structure of these viruses? Um, T equals three. Um, I was actually going to ask that question earlier, but um, let's see. We'll try this. Um, one of the other funky things I can do with this uh, remote is actually draw things. So um, how do you find out whether it's a, you know, what the triangulation number is? You need to find five-fold axes of symmetry. So here's a five-fold axis of symmetry right here, and then another five-fold axis of symmetry, oops, down here. So how do you get from one to the next? Let's do a different color here. We'll go with yellow. Um, start up here. Go one in one direction. Change. Go in the other direction. That's an H of one and a K of one, which gives us what? A T equals three. It's already up there. <laughs> H, K, H squared plus H K plus K squared. Um, one of the weird things, however, about this particular structure is there's supposed to be a maturation protein in here, but you don't see it in the structure. Why do you not see it in the structure? Any ideas? Anyone got thoughts about why you wouldn't see a maturation protein, even though we know it's in the virions when you purify virions? Why might you not see it? Yeah. No, there's nothing about us. What else? Yeah, so it's certainly possible if you could be a protein that wiggles around a little bit, um, but that's not actually the case here. Diana? Also a possibility, not true here. <laughs> David? Um, also not true, <laughs> um, but a great idea. Um, this is actually what the virion really looks like. Some of you in the, close in the front can actually see it sticking out at one of the vertices. The reason that this structure doesn't have it in there is because of the way that cryo-electron microscopy was always used to make structures. And cryo-electron microscopy depends on, or at least it used to, it's changing a little bit now, averaging lots and lots of 2D pictures. And when you do averaging of a bunch of 2D pictures, and if one little piece is sticking out, but it's in different orientations, and you average over everything, that disappears. So basically you need different algorithms or an algorithm which says don't average over things that could be sticking out or try and analyze them in such a way that you have a piece that's sticking out. Yeah? What is the benefit of having one binding site on the recombinant host versus having multiple? Wouldn't that increase the scalability of the protein? And I guess the AD inhibitor is that so the, the, the question yeah, for people in the back who didn't hear, or so I also get recorded, is yeah, why have one rather than have every single one, for instance, just to paraphrase your question, um, way of binding, um, as opposed to, again, having every single one bind? The answer, of course, is evolution. It works. <laughs> uh, but probably in this case, and as we'll see when we talk about making the different proteins, you make different amounts of those different proteins. And so just the way that the amount of protein is being regulated, you end up with 
one copy of the maturation protein and 178 of the coat proteins. So, yeah, and it may also give you an orientation. We'll see that too when we think about where the genome is. And, Set it up so it's right, right. So the genome is associated right where it's going to be entering the cell later on in terms of the encoding process. Yeah. Yeah, well, so we'll get to this um, here in, in just a second. Um, one thing that, that also told people that this was not completely correct, I'll go back to my pointer here, um, that this wasn't completely correct, is if you, you can actually make these virus-like particles in the absence of the maturation protein. But if you do that, the RNA is sensitive to an RNase. And so what that means is you really actually do need that particular protein to get the structure to be functioning properly. And it probably has to do with assembly, probably helping to bring everything together um, in the first place. So again, this was the structure until three years ago now. Um, and then this paper came out in PNAS. Actually, there were two different papers, one of Cubeta and one of MS2, um, where they did what they now call asymmetric reconstructions through cryo-electron microscopy. So they have better algorithms, better computers, better electron microscopes, and we're able to specifically say at one of the axes of symmetry, or actually one of the five-fold axes of symmetry, we're going to have something different, and we're going to align all of those with each other, and then look at everything else. And so you end up with a structure that looks like this, but this is nice review, and um, Mark Murray is actually a colleague of mine. He worked on the structure of that virion that's floating around over there. Um, so he then uh, had a nice review looking at these structural components right here. These are three identical in terms of their sequence proteins. These are all the coat protein and just shown down here. But they're all in slightly different environments. So this is that whole quasi-equivalence business. You know, we got a five-fold axis here. We have our three-fold axis here and our two-fold axis here. Also shown down here, it's a little harder to see, five-fold axis here, three-fold axis here, and two-fold axis here, which each of these individual coat proteins, each of them coming together, three of them um, in each of the faces. And so if it's a T equals three quasi-symmetric particle, let's ignore the maturation protein for now, um, how many coat proteins would you have? Mika, you're up. How many coat proteins? Steel three car particles. <laughs> That's fine. I'm giving the virion. Give him a chance to just have to think about it. <laughs> yeah, so if it were a completely quasi symmetric T equals three across the hydrogen, how many coat proteins would you have? Anyone want to help him out? Toss, toss the virion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So 60 times your T number. So great thing to remember for that midterm thing that's coming up. Um, so <clears throat> here, but of course, this is different because we have a maturation protein. It turns out that the maturation protein um, gets rid of two, which is kind of strange, of the coat proteins. And you actually end up with 178 um, of these all together. And so this was the review paper. This is the actual paper itself. Um, here, a little hard to see, but this is the whole particle. What's in pink is now the maturation protein uh, right here. So not icosahedrally symmetric. Doesn't look like any of those other proteins at all. Um, and you can see it's almost all alpha helical, so this, this pink structure um, right here. And it's just at one of the five-fold axes of symmetry. The other thing they noticed from this, which was, I think, even more interesting, and partly getting to your point about why I have one protein, is that they could also see electron density on the inside of the capsid that wasn't protein, and that turned out to be the RNA. So it's a little hard to see here, but the red double helix here is a secondary structure in the RNA, and actually all of this yellow represents the RNA present inside the virions. So what does it mean if you actually have electron density in a cryo-EM map? What does it mean about the RNA? Yeah. 
I've talked about this a little bit already. Anyone want the virion? Nobody want the virion? <laughs> Yeah, so what it means is all of those particles have RNA in the same place. So it's not just a bag with the nucleic acid floating around, like Stedman likes to call virions. Um, it's very defined. And that means that it has to be, because otherwise when you do the averaging, it would just disappear. Again, like what happened with that uh, maturation protein in the very beginning. So the fact that you are seeing density means that they are actually all really well located. So, um, so that's, again, the latest and greatest. Um, this paper, uh, actually no, this paper was in 2016, but this one I think was in 20, <clears throat> excuse me, 2018 or 2019, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So what's the maturation protein interact with? Um, turns out it interacts with pili, not surprisingly, because these were the F pilis dependent phage that they tried to discover in the first place. So <clears throat> that maturation protein, it's a little bit hard to see here, but normally a bacteria, <clears throat> with just an F pilus would have a very skinny F pilus here. But if you zoom in, you can see that this F pilus is actually completely coated by all of these T equals three, not exactly quasi equivalent because you've got that maturation protein in it, uh, that is associated with the pili. Um, when that happens, oops, getting ahead of myself here. Uh, <clears throat> when you have the binding to the pili, one of the things that F pili do in terms of helping conjugation is they pull cells together that allows the conjugation process to take place. Um, can't really take place at the, at the distance. And so you, the F pili contract. It seems that contraction of the F pilus is actually what brings the virus inside the cell. And so that the process, it's being pulled inside the cell. Again, we don't know exactly whether that's happening um, or not. And of course, you've all seen that there is a clicker question coming up. So, are there any more questions before I bring up the clicker question? Okay. So, we can share the. <clears throat> start this. Um, why is the MS2 virion not truly quasi symmetric? Oops, close. Um, because it contains four different major capsid proteins, because it's a cross link capsid, because it's a maturation protein, because it's an RNA genome, because it encodes four proteins, some in overlapping reading frames. We're going to get 100%, I swear, right? It's my goal for the term. So 18 of you have clickers today? Five, three, two, one. Yeah, remember to stop it this time so everybody doesn't get to vote again. Um, <clears throat> it's a rookie trick, except that I can't really claim that I'm a rookie anymore. So, <clears throat> um, yes, this is the maturation protein, because the maturation protein means it's not quasi-symmetric. Um, you could, if you had different proteins, I should put up here, you know, pseudo-symmetric, the P number, but that's only if you have different proteins that are established through the whole capsid. And so I wouldn't call this pseudosymmetric either. Yeah, so it is the, the fact that you have a maturation protein, again, present at one of these five-fold axes. So it's not completely quasi-symmetric. Everything else is arranged in a quasi-symmetric pattern, but you wouldn't call it quasi-symmetric because it doesn't have that um, quasi-symmetry for all of the individual um, coat protein particles. Um, and it wouldn't be, I guess I have a couple people with E, um, four proteins in different overlapping reading frames. That's totally true about the genome, but it has nothing to do with virion. Yeah. Makes sense, yes? Everybody happy with this? Or at least everyone except for the two who answered E? Okay. <clears throat> so let's <clears throat> move on and talk about the problem that you have with all RNA viruses. Translation versus replication. 
the problem, as is true with all of the polymerases that we've talked about in molecular biology, and it's true for all of the polymerases, all DNA polymerases, all DNA-dependent RNA polymerases, all RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, all polymerize from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. And ribosomes are going to translate from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So that's great. In theory, it sounds like they're going in the same direction, right? But when you're making a new copy of RNA, it's going to be going in the opposite direction. So your RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and your ribosome are going to run into each other. So you have to have some way of controlling translation versus genome replication. And pretty much all viruses have come up with different ways of doing this, and we'll talk about what's happening with <clears throat> these small RNA viruses, I should say the RNA phage, um, as we move on through this. There's another issue, and that is for every individual virion, you need one RNA, which this should be 178, not 180, typo in my slides here, uh, 178 coproteins, one maturation protein, and then for replication purposes, these replicases, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, are enzymes, so you don't need that many of them. And of course, you have this problem of replication or translation. So you have one RNA. And how do you go from that one RNA and make a bunch of coat protein, very little maturation protein, and a sort of intermediate amount of your <clears throat> replicases? And then what's that other protein that I'm not talking about yet? Certainly for MS2? The lysis protein, that fourth one. Um, so what about lysis proteins? What do you have to be really careful about for lysis proteins? We talked about this last time. Right. Don't make it too soon, because if you make it too soon, your host is going to be blown apart, and you won't have any infectious virions. So all kinds of difficult things that have to be regulated by this you know, one RNA, which has just gotten released inside your E. coli. So how does this work? Um, it's all about secondary structures in RNAs. And the accessibility of start codons for translation. So where is your AUG? And well, these are bacteria, so shine delgarno sequences. So where you have your ribosome binding site. And if you have a start codon and a ribosome binding site that's in some kind of strong secondary structure, the only way you can get shine delgarno binding or ribosome binding is if it's single-stranded. So you have to then have Wherever you want to start, translation has to be in a single-stranded form. What's the protein that we want the most of? Capsid protein, exactly. So we need 178 copies per virion. So what that means is, is that you have your, let's get this pointer working, um, the start codon and also the shine diagonal ribosome ribosome binding site for your coat protein, this is not in secondary structure. So, Ribosomes can perfectly happily come on and bind to that start codon and start to translate. And actually, they'll start to translate. And then they start to get into all of this secondary structure. And particularly in these secondary structures, there's a couple of things that I wanted to point out here. Um, the first one is this start codon for the replicase. You'll notice the start codon for the replicase here is in a very nice, strong secondary structure. And this secondary structure is such that you're never going to get any ribosome binding there if you still have this secondary structure. Um, there's also an additional secondary structure right next to it. It's called the MJ um, secondary structure, just because that's what they called it originally. It's not um, Michael Jackson or Michael Jordan, as the case may be. Um, just <clears throat> these sequences, which are here, if you mess with these sequences, um, and which you can do mutationally, um, you end up getting a lot more of the replicase protein um, and then eventually some of the, the lysis protein as well far too early on. And I just wanted to mention, should have um, emphasized here, we're just looking at this little part right here. So coat protein start is over here, um, and the termination for the start is actually after the beginning of the lysis protein, but before you get to the replicase protein. There's also this um, ribosomal S1 protein the small subunit of the ribosome. Also, this protein has some RNA binding activity. So what's going on here? You have a ribosome that's going to bind to the start codon of the coat protein gene, 
it's going to start translating, and as it's translating, it will start to get rid of some of this secondary structure. So once you have your assembled ribosome, large subunit, small subunit, the mRNA in the middle, um, the process, also GTP hydrolysis, that will pull apart secondary structures in RNA. And so that will allow these secondary structures to come apart. And what that means is eventually, once it finally gets to the end of your coat protein gene, it's pulled apart, particularly this MJ helix here, um, right after the termination, which now allows ribosomes to bind here. Now, as all of us remember, of course, oops, excuse me, from molecular biology, if you have a free ribosome binding site, and particularly if you're talking about E. coli, you're going to have lots of ribosomes all lined up right after each other. And so all of this first sets of ribosomes are going to be making lots and lots of coprotein and eventually get to the point where you're making replicase and then this, you know, you'll get a few copies of the replicase protein as well. But you end up making a bunch of, of coat proteins first. So this is great and well and good, but we're also going to need to make A, the maturation protein, which we'll get back to in just a second, but also the lysis protein. And it turns out for the lysis protein, this is a concentration dependent thing. So you need to make more and more of the lysis protein once it gets to a certain level in MS2, then you'll have the cells burst. And so you want to make small amounts of it, but you need to be continuing to build it up over time. And the way that the lysis protein is made is actually really kind of interesting. So normally, if you think about ribosomes, when they get to a termination codon, what happens? You have release factors that associate, you have GTP hydrolysis, a small subunit falls off, the large subunit falls off, and everything reassociates. What well, happens most of the time, but in some cases, the ribosome actually stays associated with the RNA. And this is true for the normal bacterial RNAs as well. And it can move back and forth a little bit. And it turns out that in some cases, and relatively few cases, only about 5% of the time, it will stay associated with the RNA and start again at this AUG, which is not far away. So we should have had this um, image here as well. Um, this start codon, for the lysis protein is pretty close to the stop codon of the coat protein. So occasionally, and again about 5% of the time, you'll have ribosomes that will now back up oops, and start your lysis protein right here. But it's pretty rare that you have this. It's only about 5% of the time, but, um, and it turns out that, again, you can do experiments where if you move this lysis start codon closer to the stop codon, you end up with more lysis protein. If you move it further away, you end up with less lysis protein. So it's clearly just a distance um, thing in terms of how you can get your, your lysis protein. So we've got our coat protein. We're starting to build up our lysis protein. Lysis protein, excuse me. Um, we have a little bit of a replicase protein. Um, what does coat protein need to do? It needs to coat genomes. And as we now know in some of these structures, it's actually really well defined where the genome actually gets packaged. But you have to have genome. So how do you get genome versus this whole, you know, again, we're translating this thing the whole time. We still need to make some of this RNA. So how does that happen? Um, it turns out that there are a couple of things that are really important about this. The first one is actually the second one on this list. And that is that the coat protein start codon is also a place where the replicase can bind to. And so it blocks further translation of the coat protein after you've made more of the replicase protein. So what happens is the way you get your timing is you know, first you make a bunch of coat because that's not in secondary structures. You get rid of the secondary structures for your replicase protein. You start to make that replicase protein. After you get a certain amount of replicase protein, it will stop making more of that coat protein. And once it's stopped, then you don't have any new ribosomes binding there. So now you don't have ribosomes that get in the way of your replicase protein. The other thing which turns out to be um, very important is when you make your negative strand, and again, the negative strand is your non-coding strand, that doesn't base pair much at all. Um, and also doesn't stay stably base paired with the positive strand, which is not surprising because it's forming all these secondary structures. And so once you've made negative strand, which you can do once you get rid of the 
ribosomes that are coming off of the coat protein um, start. Then you can make negative strand. That negative strand can then serve as a template for making positive strand. But the great thing about making positive strand, now you are going to be making that positive strand from a negative strand that the ribosome is never going to see. So whatever, again, whenever you're making RNA, you have your positive strand that has to be replicated into a negative strand. That negative strand then serves as a template for positive strand. So how do you get this negative strand replication? Turns out it's not just the replicase. The replicase actually needs a bunch of host proteins. Curiously enough, um, a bunch of host translational proteins. Now, why do you think you'd want to have host translational proteins that are necessary for replication? Why would you want to do that? So it's, tra it's not translating it its own stuff, but it's also not translating the virus genome at this point because you're trying to replicate now. You've made all your coat protein. You're good to go. So blocking translation, and particularly, what does EFTU do? What's it involved in? Way back when, molecular biology, last term, forgotten all that. So EFTU is, to some extent, it's just checking that you've got the right codon anti-codon. So I wouldn't call it proofreading per se, but it's just you know, checking your fidelity. But it's really involved in elongation. So it's that elongation process, which is really critical. Um, EFTS, which we did not talk about <laughs> last term, um, is a guanosine nucleotide exchange factor, which um, EFTU requires binding of GTP, GTP hydrolysis to release the tRNA. Um, you've got to recycle that GTP all the time. So again, basically stealing all of these translation proteins to associate with the replicase so that you're not getting translation, so you don't have ribosomes hanging out on the RNA that you're trying to replicate. There's also a so-called host factor. And why is it called host factor? It's because all the geneticists, when they were working on these viruses and how they replicated, they found some mutations in the host that wouldn't replicate their genome. And some of those actually turned out to be these translation proteins, but also a poly-A binding protein, which is important for making particular proteins. It's a regulatory protein, normally in E. coli but it's been used or coerced or co-opted is probably a better term um, in order for making viral genomes. Um, the viral genome is actually kind of interesting. There's a, it actually starts with an A in the viral genome, but the replicate starts with a G um, and it may be stolen from EFTU. So there's a GTP associated with EFTU and that may be being stolen there. That's a open question, but it is known that there's actually a non-templated A that always gets added at the end of the genome. Quite why that is probably has to do with the fact that we've got lots of hungry exonucleases, so any cell has lots of things that love to chew in at the ends of your nucleic acids, so that's probably why it has this particular case. So that's your minus strand, and the minus strand is the one that's hard because that's when you're dealing with the ribosome, everything else. Making the positive strand, is easy um, because you don't have to worry about translation. You don't have to worry about all these other things. Once you've got a minus strand, all that that minus strand does is it serves as a template to make more positive strand. So that's how we end up getting our genomes. And it turns out you end up with way more of the positive strand than the negative strand, which makes perfect sense. So almost done. We've got genome. We've got pro protein. We've replicated our genome, so we don't need the replicase anymore. We're starting to make lysis protein. What's missing? One thing is missing. One thing is missing. Who's got the virion? Right, it's the maturation protein. So we need to make the maturation protein. How do we make the maturation protein? Turns out that the maturation protein, we only need very small amounts of it, right? You now, one copy per virion. So how does the virus know, again, to totally over anthropomorphize here, just to make really small amounts of this particular protein. And so what happens is this protein is only translated from newly made genomes. And so those positive strands that you're making a whole bunch of, because the negative strand is serving as a template, that is how that maturation protein is being made. And it turns out it's being made through a very similar kind of process to what we talked about already in terms of regulating 
the replicase protein um, in terms of secondary structures. So what do these secondary structures look like? This is what the end of your genome looks like. So here's the five prime end of the genome. You've got this crazy secondary structure with its Schindel-Garnot sequence and a GUG start codon, bacteria, so they can use GUGs, not just AUGs, but they don't use them as well. Um, so if you've got this structure, which is a structure that is what you have in the RNA that's packaged in the virion, it's not going to get translated. Just no way. But if you're making new positive strand RNA, it's going from 5 prime to 3 prime. So you just made this, you know, 5 prime here, continuing along here, etc. Turns out there are other secondary structures, particularly the secondary structure right here, which normally bind to the Schindel Garner sequence. If you're just making a new RNA, before it's got this piece that it can base pair to, right here, it forms its own secondary structure, just wraps up on itself. And when it forms a secondary structure, it can't form a secondary structure with the Schindel-Garnot sequence anymore. Schindel-Garnot sequence, hanging out, what happens to Schindel-Garnot sequences? Small sub the ribosome binds to them, and you get translation. But this only happens when you're making your new positive strand RNA. So, making your new positive strand RNA, now we've got our maturation protein, this will get translated, and then actually this ribosome is literally going to be following the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is off the screen here, because it's using the negative strand to, to make more of these. So you end up with this maturation protein. So, got everything we need. Maturation protein, coat protein, genome, and the lysis protein is slowly being built up. So we're happy with this? Everybody happy? Not happy? Unhappy? Ready to answer a clicker question? Yes, no? Okay, let's try a clicker question. Control of expression of which of the following MS2 proteins is not due to the formation of alternative secondary structures? Coprotein, replicates protein, maturation protein, lysis protein, or A and D? Ten, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We do not have liftoff for 100%, so tell your neighbors what you selected and why. Let's go again. Continue to discuss. So you've got a minute to make up your minds here. So. <clears throat> 
10, 5, Okay, what do we think? Um, seem to be div divided between you know, coat protein and coat and lysis protein. So I completely agree with you on coat protein. What about the lysis protein? How do you get lysis protein? How do you get lysis protein? The ribosome backs up. Is that dependent on your secondary structure? Yeah, well, as the ribosome moves, it actually gets rid of the secondary, but what makes a difference in terms of how much you have versus how much you don't have? If you change what, what does that do in terms of, well, yeah, primary structure, but literally the sequence. So if it's further away, you end up with less, and if it's close, you end up with more. Does that have anything to do with secondary structure? No, it doesn't have anything to do with secondary structure. So what I'm looking for is, is E rather than A. Yeah, change it quickly. <laughs> Let's, uh, um, I'll, I'll select this later. So <clears throat> finally, okay, how do we get out? Um, we already talked about the lysis protein, um, and the lysis protein in MS2 um, just builds up to a certain concentration. And again, it's because the ribosome is moving back and slowly making more and more of this protein, eventually gets to a certain point, and you have enough of this protein to make a hole in the cell. But Q-beta doesn't have one of these. So how does Q-beta do this? And we didn't know this until I think it was last year. And <clears throat> actually, that was this particular cryo-M structure, which I can pass around. I was hoping you could see the t equals 3 on here. It's really hard to see the t equals 3 on this particular 3D printed version. Um, this is actually not just the maturation protein. Um, this is a maturation protein bound to a cellular protein. I think it's mer a if I remember correctly, but if I can't remember it, I don't expect you guys to. Um, but it's a cellular protein which is involved in making peptidoglycan. And peptidoglycan is what? Where do you find peptidoglycan? In bacteria, particularly it's cell wall. So making that, holding that cell wall together. What does penicillin do? Blocks forming peptidoglycan. So this is actually exactly what this guy does. It blocks the formation of peptidoglycan by taking this protein away. And so what happens is the cells explode because they're trying to grow. Their peptidoglycan isn't made properly, and so it makes a hole. And so that's exactly, so literally it's just taking away that protein. And in taking away that protein with growing cells, you end up lysing things. <clears throat> we also um, mentioned before, and now we know exactly in all the particles, you've got the genome in a specific place. Um, that happens because you have binding by the capsid protein to some of these secondary structures. And you see them literally right underneath the, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the maturation proteins um, in the virions. And you can actually identify which ones those are. So I wanted to finish up really quickly talking about some applications of some of these proteins that people have found in these viruses. Um, Particularly important is looking at the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It's really easy to make DNA. PCR works great. Um, you heat stuff up, and you've got thermostable polymerases, primers, etc. It's actually hard to amplify RNA. And a lot of things actually need RNA for some kind of diagnosis, particularly an RNA viral disease, HIV. If you're making RNA, that means that your HIV is actually actively replicating. So if you had a way of detecting very small amounts of RNA, this would be a really wonderful tool. And so what people have done is they've taken the replicase from Cubeta and looked at what it needs in order to replicate. That's partly why we looked at the secondary structures that you need. What cellular proteins do you need? And it turns out that, to make a long story short, there's this thing called MDV1, not important what it is, but it's a small RNA that has all of the secondary structures in it that Q-beta will make many, many, many copies of. But it's dependent on both ends of this MDV RNA. 
what that means you can do is if you can somehow bring these two ends together, they will replicate and they'll replicate really large amounts of whatever it is that brings those two ends together. And so this is the overview in words. I actually prefer the cartoon, which is here, where you have your MDV RNA, um, and this, this is the more newer one down here at the bottom. MDV RNA, it's only going to work and make more of this MDV RNA if these two ends are next to each other. The only way you can get those two ends to be next to each other if they're base pairing with a RNA that you're trying to detect. And so this target RNA, if it's present, then you can use this MDV RNA to amplify it. If it's not present, MDV RNA is not going to be amplified. And so it's a really nice way to detect very small amounts of RNA. And again, particularly important for things like active HIV infection, where you have very small amounts of RNA which is there. And so it's the understanding of the replicases from some of these small RNA viruses, you know, why you write whole books um, on understanding how the actual enzymes work in order to be able to develop these um, really cool replication mechanisms. So with that, I'll wish you a happy weekend. Anyone wants to come up and uh, check out the virion up here? Um, I need my Virion back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we'll see you on Monday.